Good evening all, uh, thanks for coming out tonight. My name's James, I'm one of the organisers um, of the Head Over Susie Group. Christian, your normal host wouldn't be here tonight, he's uh, solo parenting and uh, needs to stay with the kids, so uh, you just got to put it with me. Um, uh, it's a busy end of the year of what has been like a pretty full calendar for us at Perth Head Over Susie Group this year. So we recently had the uh, Event Driven Architecture Workshop where we had about 35 or 40 people um, spending a few hours building some event driven um, systems, which was cool, up at the uh, AWS office here at Perth. Uh, coming up, we've got uh, actually a new kind of sub series of the user group starting. So. Uh, we're still going to have the monthly sessions on the third Tuesday of every month, but in addition to that, uh, we're going to have a, um, a series on um, building software as a service on AWS specifically. So they're going to be running uh, scheduled to be defined, but kind of on the opposite, like a fortnight away from the normal session. I think it's first Wednesday of each month. First Wednesday, there you go. So. Yeah. Okay, Let's monthly. See. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the first one of those is in two weeks' time on the 6th of December. So talking about the core um, kind of architectural elements of SaaS on AWS. So that should be great. You can RSVP for that on um, Meetup and that's going to be held at the AWS office as well. Uh, reInvent, which is obviously AWS's um, biggest, single biggest event for the year, is going to be starting next Monday if you haven't heard about that. Uh, if you're not going to Vegas, like 60,000 other um, who are pilgriming over to there, um, you can catch the recap. So the reInvent recap is uh, going to be run on the 14th of December at the AWS office. There is a URL where you can register uh, that you want to attend that. It's not an AWS user group event, so you can't RSVP for that on the meetup.com uh, website. Um, but I'm happy to share the URL with you afterwards. I don't think we have it on a slide, so... No, but if you We'll make sure you get it, just here's some, either Jan or myself or uh, somebody. Um, so that's on the 14th, so, so it's the 6th, then we've got the 14th is the reInvent recap. Uh, and that pretty much brings us to the end of 2023 with Perth Fat User Group. Uh, we're already um, planning as well underway for the start of next year, so we can start off with a, um, more good talks. Um, but the door is always open, so if uh, you have something you'd like to share with the group, no matter how um, big or how short, uh, we'd be willing to take it on and try and work to get it into the schedule. We'd love to hear from you all and hear about the things you're learning, um, the, the, the war stories that you've got to share with the group, and um, specifically any projects you might have worked on as well where you can share some of the AWS insights. Uh, it'd be great to hear more perspective from the community. So, uh, And also if there's someone else that you'd like to hear from, uh, please let us know about that too so we can work to try and uh, approach them and get them onto the schedule and stuff like that. So um, it'd be great to have that extra contribution from you if, if there's some, if it's a story that you think is worth telling, that'd be cool. Um, so without further ado, I'll introduce tonight's speaker. Aidan Ziegler is a lead consultant at Cognizant and uh, Cognizant Serbian. It's a bit of a mouthful now, sorry. Um, <laughs> no shade. Um, they are a professional services business. He works in the uh, AWS space there. And um, uh, Aiden's a great guy to talk to. Aside from that, he knows his stuff. So I don't know if anyone saw him at Latency Conference earlier this year where he um, went deep, deep, deep on the Node.js event loop. It was an awesome talk, blew my hair back, and it's still like that, I guess. <laughs> um, and can't wait to see what he's got to share with us on uh, Rust on Lambda tonight. So uh, welcome to the stage, Aiden. Awesome. Uh, thanks, James. So yeah, uh, basically, my name's Aidan. I work at Cognizant Servian, uh, and my job is uh, as a cloud engineer to help large enterprise companies digitally transform, so building cloud native applications for them in a secure way and bringing their existing applications to the cloud. And so talking tonight about lightning fast lambdas and ephemeral compute with Rust. And to sort of understand exactly why you'd want to do that, I want to start off by Oh. Ah, there we go. Just took a couple of times to get going. Uh, start off by going into uh, where we came from, right? So we've got a very traditional three-tier web application here, uh, monolithic. We've got a presentation layer that talks to an application layer uh, that talks to a database. 
and you know everything in there is probably horribly coupled and it's all mishmashed together. And you know the monolith does everything. It does like your controllers, your routing, your authentication. Uh, it does all of your session management, your guards, um, application code and business logic. All of that sort of stuff is bundled in there. And of course, eventually, uh, this works up until a point, uh, but then it gets too hard to grok the entire monolith, and it becomes very hard to add new features, hire new developers, and you, know, you end up in that uh, you know, hell of a legacy application with a lot of technical debt. So, next best thing came around. We wanted less coupling, and we got microservices. So, now all of our code is a little bit more loosely coupled, uh, you only need to grok one service to sort of work on it and understand exactly what's going on. It's easier to hire developers. You can have self-organizing teams all building out uh, these little microservices. But these microservices, even though you might be following principles of loosely coupling and all that sort of stuff internally within them, uh, generally, you're still using those high-level abstractions that you were using in the monolith, right? So once again, your microservices, they've got routing, they've got authorization. Uh, they've got controllers, handlers, all of that sort of stuff still lives within your microservices. And so then, uh, now the only code we write in a serverless paradigm is the code that drives our business value, right? With a little bit of glue to glue all the infrastructure together. Uh, we shifted to high-level languages originally uh, because the, we required the abstractions to support all of the complexity of the applications that we're building. And now all of that high-level abstraction has been moved to the infrastructure layer. Uh, we're still you know, using the same patterns, but we're using them in a serverless way. And so uh, the reason we stick with all of these old paradigms is just because that's how we've always done it. And so we're now operating under the structure where we spin up some of the most complex runtimes, parsers, and JIT compilers just to serve a single API request. And yes, AWS has done an awful lot of work in making sure all of this is really performant and spins up really quickly. Uh, but do we really need it anymore? So what's the solution? And you might have seen this coming, but it's actually Rust. <laughs> yeah, so Rust is a, originally a systems language, right? A built replacement for C that's memory safe and you know, doesn't have all the sharp edges that C has. Uh, yeah, and I originally went into this because I was looking for something that was going to provide the performance of C and all that sort of stuff, but I actually found something a lot more powerful than I was expecting. So before we get too far into this, I'd like to give a little bit of a warning. Here be dragons. Um, a lot of the stuff we're talking about tonight is going to be either pre-release or not GA yet or you know, uh, very early on in its stage. And for a bit of an example, here's my uh, cargo.toml, which is like your package lock.json or your you know, requirements.txt or something like that. And you can notice there's a, there's a lot of zeros in this column here, which should be worrying if you're building something in production. So we will talk about a lot of the good things about Rust tonight, but just keep in mind that uh, maybe don't use it for every production workload yet right now. I'm not going to tell you to rewrite your entire application in Rust. So yeah, why did, I, why did I start down this journey of building lambdas in Rust, right? Well, there are a couple of articles I'd read and a couple of uh, points that people had made to me. And the first one was that I wanted really predictable latencies, right? So I wanted to be able to have the same execution, exactly the same, every t all, time, all the time, every time. I uh, wanted minimal cold starts, all of that sort of stuff, right? So uh, here's a good example of rewriting something in Rust that went really well for the company that did it, right? So this is Discord rewriting a cache in Rust. So what they had is they had this uh, caching service that would sit in front of their, essentially when you get at mentioned in a channel or when someone messages you directly, it's got a little counter that says you've got this many messages. That's what they were storing. They had a cache and it was all backed by Cassandra. And so that was originally written in Go. And now Go is also a natively compiled language, but it also compiles in a garbage collector to go along with that, right? So what ended up happening was every two minutes, the application would pause, scan the cache to make sure that there was you know, no memory that needed to be freed, free all the keys that had been evicted in that two minutes, and then free all the memory and away you go. And of course, that was CPU intensive up in the top left, and then it drove up the average response time and the 95th percentile of the response time, and you could get, uh, yeah, the, sorry, the time taken for the maximum as well was increased. So they rewrote it in Rust, which is the blue line, and you see there's a 
slightly higher CPU overhead on the baseline, but you don't get those garbage collector spikes anymore, which was really important. And then, of course, your response time and your average response time are uh, smooth throughout. So that's what Rust is really good at compared to Go, is you get uh, very repeatable executions. And so I like speed, um, the velocity. Uh, <laughs> And I want to, <laughs> just wanted to clarify, because we had someone mention uh, they shouldn't have had so much Coke before the last talk, but that was uh, talking about the drink, so you know. Um, yeah, I want fast cold starts. So if we look at the Lambda uh, initialization phase, uh, we've got the extension initialization, the runtime in it, uh, the function initialization, then we actually get to invoking our Lambda function. So when we're building a Rust Lambda, we're not actually using a runtime. We're building everything into the application itself. So we're not launching like a Node.js container to run our JavaScript bundle. Instead, uh, we're just running a binary, which is running natively on the Lambda itself. So that runtime sort of disappears. A function in it is what does the initialization of basically everything in the Lambda. And then we just go straight into the invoke phase. So we get very fast cold starts. And to sort of show you what the difference is, uh, AWS actually went and built the same application in a bunch of different languages, right? So I've got the TypeScript one up here just because I'm a bit of a TypeScript fan when I'm not writing Rust. Um, and I've got the Rust one down the bottom. And it's important to note that uh, when they did the benchmarks, they gave TypeScript 256 megabytes of memory and Rust 128. In Lambda, if you're not aware, CPU actually also scales with uh, memory. So the Rust one was working at 0.25 of virtual CPU and the TypeScript one was working a little bit more. Anyway, so our P50, P90, P99s, when we don't have a cold start, we're getting you know, a millisecond, a couple of milliseconds here and there in terms of the execution speed, but the init duration is significantly lower. It's like one sixth of the time uh, that it takes to initialize um, the, yeah, the application in the Lambda. And then lastly, uh, I wanted secure deployed artifacts, right? I didn't want to trade performance for something that was going to you know, turn around and shoot me in the foot and was going to have spiky edges with all the security stuff around it, right? Like, if I really wanted performance, I guess I could go and use the C++ runtime, which apparently does actually exist. I haven't written anything in it, but you know, if you want to try it, be my guest. It's slower. It's slower than Rust. Oh, okay. Good to know. Anyway, so uh, to give you an example of just how secure Rust is. This is a graph that I stole from the Chromium project. And uh, the vulnerabilities in Chromium, you can see that we've got 7% security related certs, 24% other, um, and a whopping almost 70% of our issues come from memory unsafety. And so uh, the benefit of Rust is that the memory safety is actually built into the compiler. So you don't need the garbage collector to make sure that everything's cleaned up and everything's all happy in the background. Uh, instead, uh, Rust builds the memory safety into the compiler itself. So that's sort of why I went down the path of building Rust Lambdas to start with. But I actually found a bunch of stuff along the way, which I yeah, guess wasn't really expecting uh, to, to find. So Rust actually has a really good developer experience. I was expecting you know, low-level language, OK, I'm going to be finding where my null pointers are and dereferencing stuff and all that sort of stuff. No, very easy. And that's sort of reflected in the stats. So, this is a graph from uh, Stack Overflow, uh, the, de the developer survey. And as you can see, Rust is the most admired language. And in the context of the Stack Overflow uh, survey, that means 85% uh, almost of people who work in Rust currently want to work in Rust again next year. And it's also quite up there as one of the most desired languages. So uh, yeah, 31% of people who don't currently work in Rust say they're interested in working in Rust in the future. And that's sort of been the scenario for about the last five years in Rust. So it's very much growing in popularity. And uh, yeah, people are really starting to use it. And so I thought I'd go into a couple of things that I did in Rust uh, and that I found really cool that I couldn't do in TypeScript, or, I, or TypeScript let me do too much. So the first one, I've got, these are all REPLs, by the way, that are available down on the slides. You know, I've got a variable A. It's a number. I'm adding 4 plus 5. I've got an if statement saying, if a equals 9, console.log maths still works. And otherwise, console.log maths is broken, right? You know, TypeScript goes, and away you go, says maths still works, right? But that's not actually what's going on under the hood. Because I've forgotten a second equal sign to say, to compare, is a actually equal to 9? So it's saying that 9 is true, 
and then returning math still works. So I could put 10 in there, and this would still compile. Uh, well, not compile, but you know, still run. Yeah, if I do the same thing in Rust, uh, it will very handily tell me that, hey, we expected to find a bool on this if statement, but we found uh, you know, uh, basically an empty type. So we found nothing, right? But what you might have meant to do is actually compare for equality. So it won't compile. Instead, it'll tell you, this is what we thought you should do. Uh, and you, know, you might want to check your code. And that's one of the cool things about Rust is that a lot of the errors are in compile time rather than runtime. Uh, another one that I like from the TypeScript land is the three-dimensional point. So here we have a type that is a three-dimensional point. It's got an x, y, and a z coordinate. Uh, we've got point 0.1, you know, x is equal to 1.1, y is equal to 3.6, z is equal to 4.2. We've got a second point which contains the exact same values. And then when we console.log whether those two points are equal, JavaScript will very happily tell us that no, these aren't the same memory object, right? So uh, it'll co uh, come through as false even though all the fields and what we're probably trying to actually compare is are these two points equal. If we do the same thing in Rust, Rust will throw an error saying, look, You've asked are these two things equal. You haven't actually told me how you want me to actually interpret that yet. So um, what you might be trying to do is you know, derive internal equality. So just annotate it with this derive partial equals, and we'll build all that for you. So we go ahead and do that. And derive partial equals. We set up our two points. We check our points are equal, and we log the result. And yes, it says they're equal. So, Rust will actually you know, hold your hand a lot of the way along it. So yeah, found a really good developer experience. Uh, the second thing I found was innovation was a little bit of a requirement. You couldn't just use the same tired old patterns of, you know, I'm going to mock out the AWS SDK and monkey patch this and do that, right? Because it's a compiled language. It's difficult to do that sort of stuff. Uh, so one thing I found really helpful, which I'll go into a little bit later, was uh, hexagonal architecture. And hexagonal architecture really simplifies a lot of the stuff uh, that I was trying to do. And then hexagonal architecture was really good for helping me test my domain. But then uh, for the actual integration testing and checking whether the system works as a whole, I had to do a lot of testing in the cloud. And so uh, you know, it drove good infrastructure practices, having infrastructure as code, rapidly deployable environments, all of that sort of stuff uh, was required to, to make it all work. Uh, and then finally, was, there was a smoother than expected learning curve. So I was expecting to, you know, I'm using a low-level language to write Lambda. This is going to be difficult, right? And so there's a bunch of tools available. Uh, the first being Cargo Lambda. Cargo is like uh, Rust's NPM. It's the, it's the package manager for Rust, right? And Lambda is basically an NPM module, or Cargo Lambda is basically an NPM module that allows you to run uh, additional commands, like Prettier or something like that. It's an extension to the build system. Yeah, so Cargo Lambda basically uh, scaffolds out your Lambda functions for you. It makes them very easy to, um, to template out. Uh, it's got its own liquid templating that you can plug into. And then it also uses the Zig compiler to cross-compile to whatever architecture you really want to really run it on. So if you're running an M1 Mac and you want to run on x86-64 Lambdas, you can do that. Or if you're on a, you know Intel PC and you want to compile for a Linux ARM64 Lambda, you can do that too. It's great. Uh, the second piece of tooling, which was really cool, is the AWS Rust SDK, which is in developer preview at the moment. Uh, but the way AWS actually does their SDKs is really cool. They've got this internal, well, it's open source, but they develop it internally. It's a IDL that they use called Smithy. And basically, they write a bunch of glue. Uh, so things like you know, requests libraries and cryptographic libraries and stuff like that uh, in the language that they're targeting. And then the actual... Uh, SDK and the interfaces that are generated now and all that sort of stuff are generated through Smithy IDL. The benefit being that you change, you know, you create a new service, you update uh, Smithy, and then it gets generated out into all the SDKs. So even though it's still developer preview, it actually has pretty much every AWS service solely from the fact that it's already generated or able to be generated out. And the final piece of the puzzle is the Rust runtime for AWS Lambda. So the Rust runtime for AWS Lambda is basically all of the stuff that you have to build in custom runtimes for Lambda. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff which I'll get into a little bit in the next slide that you need to make it work, like uh, calling a Lambda API, instantiating, stuff like that. The 
uh, Rust runtime for AWS Lambda actually abstracts all that away so that it feels a lot more like writing like a typical Python or JavaScript Lambda. And so uh, as an example of that, I've got this sequence diagram here where, uh, so what happens when a Lambda is actually instantiated? Lambda will instantiate the Lambda function and it won't actually push an event or anything like that. It's just basically saying, hey, I need a new Lambda function, let's go. Uh, the init phase will run and then what happens is in a loop, it'll actually go to the Lambda API and say, give me the next event. It fetches that event back and executes it and then sends a result back out to the Lambda API. When you're using uh, runtimes like Node.js or Python or all those sorts of things, this is actually all abstracted away for you. You don't need to deal with any of this. Um, and so this is what the Rust uh, runtime for AWS Lambda actually abstracts away as well. So now I've got a uh, little bit of a live demo. So hopefully that hasn't jinxed it, but uh, we'll give it a go. So I just wanted to show exactly what it looks like uh, building a Rust Lambda. Yep. Of course, that's come up on there. Hold on, I might just mirror my displays. Cool, okay. And I've got my notes here, so hopefully the demo gods are nice to us. Cool, so I've got a new folder here, brand new, uh, nothing in it. Let's get started. So I've already installed all of the tooling for this. So uh, if you're using Rust, then it's easy to install via Rust up. Uh, Cargo Lambda can be installed via Brew or Scoop if you're on Windows. And then I'm also going to use Terraform for this because you know infrastructure as code is good. So uh, first thing we're going to do is Cargo Lambda init. And it's going to ask us, is this a HTTP function? And I'm going to put this at the end of a function URL. So yes, I'm going to say yes, it is. And it'll basically spit us out a hello world uh, lambda function. So can you guys see that? Is that too small? Yeah, let's make it a bit bigger. Is that a bit better? Cool. OK. Uh, it's going to take a little while to index all the libraries and stuff like that to make sure it's all working. Um, so yeah, that's Rust Analyzer, which is just a, a syntax highlighting uh, tool. There we go, it's done. So like C, you've got a main function, and this can be thought of as the code you want to run once when you initialize your Lambda function, right? So this is what goes outside your handler in your index.js if you're using a TypeScript Lambda. Um, so at the moment, I've just got uh, some boilerplate here, which turns off a bunch of the stuff we don't need from the tracing. Um, and then we basically want to run our service function and we've got a function handler here. And this is like our handler uh, that we export from our you know, uh, index.js. So all we're doing is we're taking an event. Uh, we're hopefully finding a query param uh, with the uh, key name. And then you know, we'll respond, you know, hello, whoever that name is. This is an AWS Lambda HTTP request. And if we don't get something, we'll respond world. Uh, and then you know, build it into an actual HTTP response and send it off. So uh, from there, let me quickly jump onto my next page. So to get this up and running, uh, first thing we can do is, if I can type, uh, build, cargo lambda build. We're going to compile it for ARM64. Um, and we're going to use release. So we want to build a production build. We don't want to build a uh, you know, debug build with all the debug symbols enabled because they can actually get quite big. So uh, this is one of the complaints that a lot of people have about Rust is that it does take a little while to compile, um, but it's uh, worth the wait. So now I'm going to cheat a little bit and take some Terraform that I have from over here. And this is basically the Terraform to uh, create it, so I'm just going to change this to AWS demo. Uh, my file is called 
AWS underscore user group underscore demo. Yeah, so what this is doing is we're basically spinning up uh, a policy document saying Lambda can assume this policy. Uh, we're going to give it a Lambda role and a policy attachment. And then we're going to create an archive file from the uh, binary that we just created. And we're going to output that to uh, an archive. Then we're going to create a Lambda function from that archive. Uh, the handler is called Bootstrap. That's the name of the binary that we've created. Our runtime is actually provided AL2023. And that just means we're using Amazon Linux directly. We're not instantiating any runtime or anything like that. We're going to provide a binary that runs natively on AL2023. The cool thing is, you know, it is actually a full uh, Linux environment. So if you wanted to write your Lambda function in Bash, this is what you could use. So we've got that, and hopefully uh, this will all work. I'm just going to probably going to need to assume credentials. Yep. Uh, and jump on to the next bit. Just going to Terraform init to download our providers. So AWS and archive. And let it install. Oh, yeah, well, that's probably going to help. <laughs> it shouldn't matter for installing the, uh, the providers, though. Now, it was promised that the, uh, <laughs> the Wi Fi would be fast enough. No, there we go. We've got one, and hopefully archive should be fast. Awesome. OK. So now we've done that, we can terraform apply. Yeah. Apply. Uh, yep. Yeah. And I always forget to write the actual word yes, because you can't use Y. And it'll go through, and it'll create all our infrastructure. And then hopefully at the end, it's going to spit out a function URL that we can use to um, actually communicate with our uh, newly deployed Lambda. There we go. So we've got our function URL. And we should be able to just curl that function URL and get, there we go, hello world. This is an AWS Lambda HTTP request. Hey! <laughs> uh, and then, you know, who we can go equal to AWS uh, percent 20 user percent 20 group and then oh it was name sorry who was my uh was my other one yeah there we go hello AWS user group this is an AWS Lambda HTTP request great so now we can uh you know talk to an AWS Lambda function it was very quick to deploy uh, but let's talk to a couple of AWS services now Let's get the AWS SDK involved. So what we're going to do is use our package manager uh, to cargo add, and let me get these names right, AWS-config and AWS-SDK secrets uh, manager. And it's going to go and fetch all this stuff. Hopefully, internet's fast enough. Cool. Awesome. OK. And once again, it's going to go through and index all that stuff. And the first thing we're going to do is set up our uh, SDK config. So uh, let SDK underscore config. Hopefully, Code Whisperer comes in to note. That's a very old package for AWS SDKs. So underscore config uh, from env. Oh, there we go. It's now. Ah, excellent. <laughs> So uh, let's use the new behavior, load defaults, which I think takes a uh, default behavior, AWS config behavior version. Uh, there we go. It should be about right. There we go. Uh, and let uh, secrets uh, manager equal, uh, yep. Yeah. There we go, AWS SDK Secrets Manager with our uh, SDK config. 
So now uh, what we'll do is we'll modify our function handler to be an anonymous function, still take our event, we're going to pass our event through to our function handler and we're also going to pass through a reference to our secrets manager. And that's coming up as an error for now, but uh, we'll be good to go in a second. So we'll just create a new parameter, which I've got back here. Uh, so we've got our client. That is a reference to uh, AWS SDK secrets manager dot dot client. And then what we're gonna do, we're gonna have who, and then we're also going to get a random string just from Secrets Manager, just to show that this all works. Uh, random string equals client dot get random password. Perfect. Uh, then we're gonna send that. Uh, that's not correct. Uh, wait, if it's got something, then we'll get the random password that it returns. And then all we're going to do is uh, go who equals who. We're going to say your random string is random underscore string. And just put in a parameter for that too. There we go. Random string is random string. Hopefully that all says it's good. Format's all happy. Uh, it's still saying something's an error. Option string. Need to, uh, do I need to dot unwrap or something like that? Yeah. Okay, there we go. That's different from when I installed the AWS SDK this morning. Once again, uh, this stuff is uh, constantly evolving, so uh, it's not necessarily 100% ready for production, but yeah, it's definitely something useful. Great, so now I've got a Lambda function. I'm just gonna go and steal a policy quickly to uh, let me also access Secrets Manager. There we go, so we've got Secrets Manager get random password, and we're just adding um, a uh, yeah, IAM policy for it and an IAM role policy attachment for the Lambda role that we gave our Lambda. And now we should be able to Terraform apply. It'll update our stuff in place. Uh, it's already compiled the function because it's already ready to go. And if we just give it a yes. Oh, hold on, no, I forgot to cargo Lambda build, sorry. Why type it out when you can press up 50 times? There we go, so now it's going through and also compiling all of the stuff required for the AWS SDK. And hopefully, in a little bit, um, we'll be good to go. So yeah, this was one thing I came up against constantly when using Rust, is that the uh, build times can take quite a while. Uh, once you have built all your libraries and stuff like that though, it will cache them, so you don't need to go through this whole arduous process every time. Normally it's just this last little step that it's gonna take and then once that's compiled, uh, it'll go through and yeah, uh, hopefully be ready for release. Um, yeah, this step normally takes about a minute. I thought I had a minute worth of stuff to talk about, but maybe not. <laughs> there we go, 50 seconds, okay, excellent. So now I can Terraform apply again. It's gonna go through and tell us that uh, there should be Yep, we need to modify our Lambda function, enter a value, yes. It's gonna go through and upload our new binary that we've just created that also includes the stuff for accessing Secrets Manager. There we go. And now, once again, should be able to press up a bunch of times. Hello, AWS user group. This is an AWS Lambda HTTP request and your random string is something we've got from Secrets Manager. So now we've gone, we've integrated with the AWS SDK and we're actually using AWS services. So the integration is actually fairly tight. I think that only took about 15 minutes. So you can get from zero to up and running really, really fast. So now I'm gonna go back to stop mirroring and hopefully
Ah, it kept the order. Excellent. Okay. Oh, it looks like I've got an errant slide in there as well. That one we've already done. So now, you know, that's us building a uh, serverless Rust application, or sorry, a serverless function in Rust. But how do we go about building a serverless application? So uh, to do this, I basically went and built a simple storefront API. So we've got our user service, which, you know, users sign up with emails and they can, uh, you know, update their emails, update their details. They've got usernames, stuff like that. We've got a product service to create, delete, and get products and also to update products. And then we've got a cart service. Um, and the cart is per user and contains products, as you'd expect. And then basically all of these are backed by DynamoDB. And whenever you do any data modification or any data uh, changes, it'll uh, send an event through to Amazon EventBridge. And then say you do something that would you know, affect other objects in DynamoDB, like deleting a user, you don't want their cart anymore, then we've got an event bridge source for the user deleted. And then if you delete a product, you don't want that product in people's carts. So uh, we've got some stuff down there. And this is really where the hexagonal architecture came into it because uh, I found that, yeah, I really need that separation between the domain, which was testable in Rust, and the integration, which was the wider cloud. So this is sort of what it ended up looking like, right? Uh, I was originally looking at either application load balances if I built this as a web service or Amazon API Gateway for Lambdas. Of course, went with API Gateway because we're using Lambda. Uh, that goes through an adapter to a HTTP port. The domain does its processing. It'll send an event out to the event port and it'll persist storage through a storage adapter. Uh, once again, was tossing up RDS or DynamoDB. Went with DynamoDB because, you know, we all love managed services. Um, and then, of course, on the other side, you can also have an event come in through Amazon EventBridge. And so uh, from the hexagonal architecture perspective, it made it really easy. Uh, you basically unit test that, right? Your domain, all of your business logic is well encapsulated. You've got well-defined ports for exactly uh, how it interacts with the wider world. You can simulate those ports and then unit test the domain in isolation. And then you deploy an environment and integration test that, right? So then you run a full suite of integration tests against the actual cloud. And that's more like a, a black box test to check that you've got the right um, information coming in and out in the order that you want it to come in and out. So now, <laughs> jumping back into uh, the code a little bit, I wanted to take a little vertical slice just down uh, the cart clear path and just show you exactly what that looks like from a AWS Lambda function perspective. So yeah, we've got a little bit of a a walk to take through the code base. Let me mirror my screens again. Uh, that's the one. Okay. Is that large enough for everyone? Yeah. Cool. Okay. So starting at cart clear, uh, remember that's the one where a user can either clear their entire cart or we get an event that a user's deleted, then we want to go through and delete that user's cart for them. So we've got a HTTP adapter, and this basically is all that stuff we saw before, right? We're setting up, uh, I've got a meta repository here for the credentials. I've got an eventing repository, which is essentially a wrapper around Amazon EventBridge. And then I've got a cart repository adapter. And the reason for using this repository pattern is that our port takes uh, objects with certain traits. And a trait is basically like an interface that's defined on a struct inside uh, Rust. And so our eventing repository actually has DynamoDB behind it, but the domain doesn't need to know that that's DynamoDB behind it. It just knows I'm expecting an interface that when I call this, it does this, right? So we set up all of our um, basically adapters in our HTTP adapter. Uh, we call our Lambda driving adapter, and this takes all the stuff that takes a uh, Lambda HTTP request and turns it into a generic Rust HTTP request, right? So the HTTP port then takes a basically a HTTP port request object, which is a, uh, an abstraction over the Lambda HTTP object and basically provides a way for us. So if we were using Axum or you know, a web framework or something like that, we'd use the same port. We just have a different adapter for the HTTP source. And we do a couple of things to pull out some path parameters, uh, like the username, uh, do some error handling, stuff like that. And then we call our core, which is our domain, right? And so our domain uh, will attempt to clear the cart. It'll get the event result. 
uh, oh, sorry, the cart result, and if it's okay, then we'll emit an event saying that we've removed this item from the cart. Uh, sorry, we've removed all items from the cart and uh, send through the result of that. And then uh, the other side, uh, if a user has been deleted, we've got an event bridge adapter, which once again takes, you know, sets up all of our repositories and stuff like that. It takes a Lambda event, uh, which wraps a CloudWatch event. And then all we do is we unwrap that to pass down to our eventing port. So our eventing port only has the concept of our internal event, event user deleted. Uh, and I've just versioned them, so V1, right? And then once again, that calls our cart clear delete call. Um, yeah, so that's the uh, driving side of the adapters. And then the driven side of the adapters, uh, we've got our eventing uh, repository. So we've got our eventing port, which uh, just has a function called emit. We've got a type that's a serializable event. And all we want to do is, uh, you know, we want to be able to receive a serializable event and emit it out the other side to whatever our eventing service is downstream. Uh, and then we've actually got our uh, event wrapper. Hold on, it's been a while since I've looked through this. Event emitter. Ah, oh, here we go. So there we go. We've got basically our serializable event. Our serializable event is set up for. Um, uh, oh, there it is. Oh, there we go, there's our eventing repository. So this is basically the actual implementation of our eventing repository. And uh, this creates a new client for us to send items on. Uh, if we go to cart items removed, uh, we can see we've got a serializable event. Uh, we can get the event type, we can get the version, serialize all that sort of stuff there. And then it's also we're able to call the emit function on it to actually emit it to the event bus. Uh, and then we also have our models and our persistence repository. So models are like an abstraction. So this is essentially your RRM, I guess. So we've got a cart. And a cart is basically a series of entries that contain a product ID, a user ID, quantity, created at, updated at. And then we've got uh, basically a... Uh, so we're implementing DynamoD model for cart item, which basically tells us a way to serialize and deserialize a cart item. And then we've got our cart repository port. So these are all the functions that our, our cart port has. And uh, so we've got get cart by user, by user ID, add cart item, remove cart item, all that sort of stuff. And then once again, we've got our actual implementation. And so when we go through to unit test all of this, right, we've got our domain and we've only got a very simple domain here. Uh, and all we need to do is we mock out our cart repository port uh, and we mock out our eventing port and then we get our results and you know, check that it's all okay and we do a couple of error handling uh, bits and pieces in there. And so to test all of this, uh, test uh, dash rust. So hopefully this will all compile and will go and run all of our unit tests for us and all of our unit tests pass. So we've managed to test our domain. And then I've also got uh, all of these tests in, under test integration that are basically uh, integration tests. Yeah, so we've got our cart clear tests where we actually call as a user to uh, clear our cart. And we're adding a bunch of items and all that sort of stuff and checking that it clears. And then in eventing, we've also got, you know, we're creating a user, we're adding a bunch of items to that user's cart and then we're checking that those uh, items are deleted. And so then to do that, it's basically same sort of thing, and hopefully internet works here because sometimes it takes a little while too long to run. But yeah, it'll go through and it'll actually test it from a black box perspective. And so that's what I was saying. You need to sort of be uh, on the ball with how you test your application code because not all of it's easily testable through Rust. So that'll go through, test everything, and hopefully, yeah, 36 passing. Awesome. So now I'll jump back into the presentation. So that was all well and good, right? We had a Rust application. It was all running. Uh, we've tested it as a black box. We've tested the domain. And so how does this fit 
into the AWS Well-Architected Framework. And so the first pillar of the AWS uh, Well-Architected Framework is operational excellence, and that's basically the way that you develop code and all that sort of stuff. And there's nothing particularly special about Rust in that regard, but it's important to note that it doesn't actually preclude you from using any of those best practices that you would normally use with any other code base, right? So uh, like we saw before, we've got very cheap and fast uh, environments that can be spun up, spun down, tested against, developed against, all that sort of stuff very quickly. Uh, we can do atomic changes uh, to our Lambda functions with a very limited blast radius because once again, everything's loosely coupled. We're only updating a very small part of our application at any one time. And then you know, our infrastructure deployment, build and testing can all be run as code. So you know, best practice there as well. Uh, now, everyone always talks about Rust security and I, this is another one of the AWS well-architected pillars. Uh, I showed you this graph before. So if you are after performance and you want to maintain security, Rust is a really good uh, way to do that. And I thought I'd quickly dive into just a little touch on how Rust actually does that. So Rust has the concept of ownership and borrowing inside it, right? So uh, basically, uh, you only have one owner and you can borrow uh, references to uh, variables. So here I've got a mutable variable uh, called num, which is equal to 42. I take an immutable reference to it, and that's R1, and that's all okay, right? We're allowed as many immutable references to it as we want. Uh, but as soon as we try and take a mutable reference to it, it'll say, well, actually, we've actually got an immutable borrowed against that already. We're not going to let concurrent access and you know, multiple uh, access happen to this variable. And so this won't actually compile. And it takes a little while to get your head around how this works, but uh, once you get used to the paradigm and you're used to um, you know, cloning where you need to or yeah, ideally stay away from it. <laughs> but yeah, if you, um, if, once you get used to the uh, paradigm of yeah, immutable references and mutable references and all that sort of stuff, it's fairly straightforward. And another important part of security is traceability, especially in cloud environments and when you've got you know, large amounts of infrastructure being deployed. And so it's very lucky that we've got OpenTelemetry available for Rust. So you can use OpenTelemetry spans inside your Rust lambdas and export that to basically any target supported by OpenTelemetry. Um, I haven't got around to it yet, but I am going to implement the X-Ray sync for this project, where you can sync all of your OpenTelemetry spans into X-Ray and then you know, have full traceability end-to-end -end through your application. Uh, I haven't really gone too much into reliability, but uh, I think I actually did touch on this point a little bit before, is that Rust really fails compile time, uh, really prefers compile time errors over runtime errors, right? And you know, it sounds like much for muchness, but once you actually get into it, like not having to deploy something and reach that one edge case where your code actually crashes and being able to pick that up at compile time is really handy. So um, when I was writing this, I originally was using um, the email as the main user ID field, but then I wanted to use path parameters. I was like, I don't really want an email and a path parameter. So I rewrote my DynamoDB access patterns, right? And everyone knows rewriting DynamoDB access patterns, not fun. Anyway, I went and rewrote it anyway. And by the time I got it to compile and I had changed the tests and all that sort of stuff, it actually worked first time. And so that's something you very rarely see in like a JavaScript or a TypeScript um, code base. Now, I've talked a lot about how Rust is fast. And yes, it is a natively compiled language. It is very fast. Uh, but to sort of illustrate this point, uh, I went and built a, another Lambda function, different to the ones you've already seen, uh, for a very common task that a lot of us have. Um, so if you are using custom authorizers with AWS API Gateway, um, that's one function that you can use Rust in with you know, pretty uh, mature libraries and see a performance benefit. So I've got this graph here where we've got our Rust execution times, which are centered around almost one millisecond. And you know, a lot of them actually execute faster than one millisecond. And this was the first time I actually saw something execute smaller than the minimum billable increment for AWS Lambda which is kind of cool. Node is centered around two milliseconds, but we've got this nice massive long tail in the last uh, end of the histogram down there. So what's going on there? Well, it's actually, you know, every fifth user is getting hit with a very long execution time in our JWT custom authorizer uh, in Node. And so, um, yeah, around 80 milliseconds and 20 milliseconds. I didn't actually do any profiling to work out exactly what that was, but if I had to guess, it's probably something to do with garbage collection. So, you know, uh, take that as you will. 
Uh, and then finally, and arguably the most important part of the well-architected framework uh, is sustainability. And I think, you know, we're very used to just spinning up cloud resources because cloud resources are cheap, right? That's the benefit of cloud resources. We spin them up, away they go, um, all happy days. Uh, but it's important to think about, you know, how sustainable our code is going to be and, you know, the resources we are actually consuming. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about what I call the myth of write once, run anywhere. Um, you know, they've sort of become ubiquitous with cloud applications. Uh, you know, and Lambda supports things like Python, Node.js, and all that sort of stuff. And we're spinning up, once again, these really complex runtimes to run this write once, run anywhere code inside Lambda with all of this overhead and all that sort of stuff just to, you know, serve an API request. And, you know, we're using these write once, run anywhere languages because they're handy to use in that regard, but we're deploying them to extremely homogenous infrastructure. Like, gone are the days where we deploy our applications to 50 different types of on-prem server, right? So we've got a very repeatable, um, homogenous environment that we're deploying our functions to. So why can't we use something that's natively compiled and has all of the benefits along with it? Uh, so the big question, uh, oh, sorry, I've got one more slide before the end of it. Uh, this is a study that was done on a whole bunch of programming languages. They basically implemented the same program in a bunch of places, in a bunch of different languages, and compared them for uh, energy consumption, time, and memory consumption. Rust, it's not so great at the memory, um, but is very fast in terms of execution time. It's actually faster than C++ in a lot of cases, only 4% slower than C, which given the uh, trade-offs that you make going for C over Rust in terms of the memory on safety and stuff like that, is a very small price to pay. And as far as energy goes, it's only 3% less energy efficient uh, than C. Uh, and that's, you know, cloud energy. It's a lot more energy efficient than C in terms of the developer energy that needs to be spent to write it. Yeah, and so the big question is, can I use this today? Um, yeah, you can. I'm not going to stop you, right? I'm not going to tell you to rewrite your entire application in Rust tomorrow. That's not going to happen. But there are definitely use cases where it can be beneficial. Um, there are a few points I'd like to make, though, around if you are going to use it in production, just you know, stick with crates and libraries that are at least v1 where possible so they have some stability behind them. Uh, you know, I know AWS SDK and the Rust Lambda runtime aren't uh, generally available yet. But you know, they're fairly stable because AWS is the one uh, developing those in the background. Uh, Cargo Lambda actually just went version 1, so you can actually use that. That uh, was a, a really cool thing to see. Uh, yeah, plan your use case and what dependencies you're going to require well in advance, right? Because uh, a lot of tooling does exist for Rust, but it's not as mature as other languages. So you might go, OK, this, you know, we can definitely need a performance boost here. We're going to rewrite this in Rust. And then, you know, whatever third-party tooling you use or whatever you're trying to connect it up to, you might have to build custom tooling for it. So it can be a little bit of a time sink if you find yourself in that scenario. And then what can you actually use it for? Well, uh, like I showed before, custom Lambda, authorizes, custom Lambda authorizes. If you've got some really complex authorization logic in there, uh, Rust is a good contender because you can use a lot of mature libraries in there. And uh, it will speed up basically every request for like probably you know a couple of hundred lines of Rust. Uh, things that are you know require a lot of processing, so like thumbnail generation, or even like a, a data ingester from like Kinesis or something like that. Anything that's doing on-the-fly data transformation that needs to keep up with the constant stream of data. So yeah, uh, that's basically uh, the talk. Uh, I probably sped through it a little bit too fast, but yeah, if you want to. Connect with me on LinkedIn. That's my LinkedIn. If you're interested in the code, uh, that's the GitHub repo for it. And there's a bunch of other Rust-related stuff on there. So yeah, feel free to take a peruse. Questions? Oh, and applause. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, let's uh, quickly jump into that. And I'll show you the only interesting thing about it. I'm just going to mirror displays again. So the little bit of magic that makes this work is basically this here, right? So we're saying, you know, that's the only thing that's different to a typical Lambda. Normally, you give the Lambda the runtime you're going to use. Uh, we're saying we're providing something that's going to do everything that a Lambda runtime normally does. 
So that's the only special thing about the Terraform file. Um, yeah, other than that, it's just basic IAM policies, a Lambda function, and away you go. It's uh, not too complex. Uh, but yeah, it's, if you're interested in just seeing how it all deploys, it's on the um, GitHub link. So yeah, take a look at that. Other questions? All right, I think you were first, yeah? Yep. So uh, Rust is uh, compiled binary. Yep. Is it rely on runtime as much as not Yeah, so that's a very good question actually, because I was thinking about putting this into my reliability slide, but I didn't want to put words into AWS's mouth. So I'm glad you brought it up. So uh, what happens with runtimes and stuff like that is AWS has a you know deprecation schedule. It's uh, pretty aggressive, so I think Node.js 14 um, just is fully deprecated now, and I think 16's well on its way, which is, yeah, yeah, very fast, right? They're, they're on the ball with it. Um, but the Rust runtime, or the runtime that we're compiling into our binary, it isn't a runtime in the sense that it's going to run your application code. It's all, you know, part of that same binary. So unless AWS changes the way the Lambda API serves events out to your binary when your binary requests them, then you're not going to see any problems, right? And that's a pretty mature interface. I'd like to think AWS isn't going to change it, but you know, don't quote me on that because I don't work for AWS. So, <laughs> yeah. Just to add that too, um, AWS has now started publishing a forward-looking view on runtimes that are going to be released. So, it used to sort of sneak up on people when they were going to launch it, and, and now I think they've projected something as far as 12 months. So, um, allows teams to prepare, which I think is a really good thing. There's cool. question in here, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, how does this work with the native service integrations like DynamoDB Streams, um, SQS Poll, and is that all done for you when you do that Lambda handler? Like, uh, handler? So, I haven't checked DynamoDB Streams, but I know there's a bunch of stuff in the Lambda runtime uh, crate that I showed before. Uh, so there's a crate called Lambda Events, and that actually has a lot of the event structs already built out for you. And so basically you say, um, you know, I'm consuming DynamoDB streams. It'll, um, you might have to write a little bit of the handler yourself, like it might not scaffold it out as nicely. Um, but then, you know, you consume that event. You don't have to write any custom structs and keep it up to date with whatever AWS is doing. That's all handled. Um, and then you just set up your triggers as you would normally uh, through infrastructure as code. Yeah. But yeah, all of the stuff to interact with it is, is in there. there. Is actually Yes. Two? It's an official one, the Lambda events, and then there's a community AWS Lambda events as well. Yeah, yeah. Which I think has Dynamo streams. I'm not sure. <laughs> it's funny you mentioned you could run Bash. I've done it once, and it was with an <laughs> integration, and I looked at how to actually consume one of the, you know, one of the native integrations, and I'm just like, no, I'm writing this Yeah, code. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a fun time, yeah, trying to reach those edge cases of Lambda. Uh, any other questions? Nope. That was awesome. Thanks very much. I have another chance. Cheers.